John, we're speaking at a pretty special time right now, right? So Tokyo has just entered their kind of second wave of coronavirus and things like that. And so most people are working from home. How's the COVID working from home experience going for you? Uh, I think it's amazing, actually. I'm, I'm like really thrilled about the whole, whole remote work thing. I, I never really liked going to the office. And so I love mm -hmm. it. <laughs> I'm so glad. Well, how's, it, how's your company been? Has it been an easy transition? I know some companies have really struggled. How's, how's your transition been? Yeah, so I, mean, I currently work at Indeed, uh, and Indeed's fairly open to kind of new ideas. And, and even before it officially became uh, remote work, um, I was actually working from home like two to three days a week. Um, so, you know, like the company culture itself is, is flexible. And so the transition was, I think, rather seamless. Um, and I think all from what, what I've heard, we're working from home, uh, at least into next year, summertime. So I'm just enjoying it while I can. Oh, wow. Incredible. That is certainly, uh, for someone that enjoys remote work, that's certainly a, a great thing. So if we now think about you know, you said that you, you, you worked at, at Indeed, maybe for those that don't know yet, um, maybe you can give a little bit of context to your, your Japan story, because yours is a particularly interesting one. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I, I came to Japan for college um, about 16 years ago, or 15, 16 years ago. Um, we actually shared the same uh, study abroad program in Osaka. Right. And, uh, and I, just, I just didn't go home. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I just, instead of going back to graduate, I just transferred into a university here and I finished up and I, mm -hmm. um, I decided to, to kind of do what the locals do, which was I did the job finding activities and all that. Um, while I was in Osaka and, and in Tokyo, I had some job offers and uh, it was actually, it was kind of, wasn't just random. Um, there was a, you know, the global recession was happening 2008 and nine when I was graduating. So uh, with, with all my friends back home, not getting job offers, and I was getting job offers in Japan, I decided to kind of ride out what I had going for me. And I just stayed in Japan. Um, I was homeless for about a month in an oh, internet gosh. cafe, just between the transition from going to Osaka to Tokyo. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just made it work and uh, kind of took advantage of being in Japan and where the economy wasn't as badly hit. So then after I graduated, you know, I, I had a job offer and I, I picked one. I also had internships going at the time and I just continued to work in Japan and I just, I just never went home. Um, <laughs> and so I just made it work out, right? <laughs> and if we think about just making it work out, I'm sure that, you know, and your personality is kind of one that that you can kind of make something extremely difficult sound extremely easy. Um, but making it work, and I can imagine it's probably more, more complex than one might, might imagine. What were kind of those, those things that helped you make it work? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, just like being very persistent and um, tenacious and just not giving up on stuff, of course, in general. But, um, you know, I, I think I was, I was rather lucky because I spoke really good Japanese. And so that kind of opened the doors for me in terms of um, getting into the fields that I wanted to get into. Um, before actually I came to Japan, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but then uh, you know, I was studying economics with the intention to, to go to med school when I went back. But I, um, I decided actually I, I wanted to pursue banking um, and stay in Japan. And so one of the companies that had given me an offer and, and for the entry process of like standardized testing and whatnot, I had done quite a bit of studying for it, it was a UBS uh, investment bank. And so I joined them out of college and, and uh, did what it took to, to, to get a banking job, right? And um, so yeah, I, I think it's just having a goal in mind and, and kind of pursuing that. And I think the other thing that was different is I didn't really focus on the Japanese elements. Um, I focused more on my strengths, which were like math and my economics and finance studies, right? And that, that's really what gets you in the door at a bank. 
That's so, that's so interesting. So if we do kind of a quick wrap up, wrap up to you being in a deed, what were the, what were the other um, jobs along the way? Yeah, um, uh, I realized I actually hated investment banking. <laughs> uh, and so- That's a common um, story. <laughs> Some past experience. I actually, I worked in a startup in, in high school. I did, uh, did uh, software development. And in one of my internships, I, I did marketing for a startup. Um, and so uh, I, I could basically got back into that work by joining Groupon after the bank and just continue to work at technology companies and uh, kind of doing my own thing uh, between companies as well, trying new business ideas and whatnot. Um, but mostly it was marketing work between then and what I'm doing now at Indeed. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What I was super interested in when we were kind of, you know, brainstorming what we kind of wanted to talk about is that you, you blew two absolute Japanese truths out of the water for me, which was that someone like you that's built a really robust, successful career in Japan, that you said, you don't bring meishis, you don't believe in business cards, which is kind of step one of doing business in Japan. And the other thing is that you said bring expertise, not Japanese, right? And for someone like you, who's fluent in Japanese, this is kind of well, something that I guess many people would think is kind of, you know, counterintuitive. So can you talk a little bit about how, how on earth you build a career in Japan without walking around with meshis and without believing in Japanese being your superpower. <laughs> well, for the record, I think your Japanese is like 10 times better than mine. No. <laughs> like, um, I, well, I, I guess what, what I tried to focus on was my focus on doing work in Japan wasn't necessarily to be a translator or focus mm -hmm. on the Japanese. Um, I had specific interests and expertise I wanted to acquire and develop. And I decided, you know, I think that's the most important aspect of, of working in Japan. Um, the, the reasons being is I think maybe you've kind of come to understand this is, you know, no matter how good you get at Japanese, no matter how hard you try to assimilate, you'll never be Japanese. And no one will recognize you as that. <laughs> right? That's it. You're right. Japanese really good yeah i um, know and especially for you and i that we're quite not japanese looking yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like you know i i speak japanese to someone and you know there's been a ton of skits on youtube about it where they don't <laughs> process what i'm saying and so you know i think it's it's one of those things where i just figured that I would play to other strengths that mm -hmm. what Japan really respects. Um, I think one example is when you, you think about authors, right? Mm -hmm. Who are all the authors that get invited to speak in Japan? Um, no one that wrote a book in Japan, because um, you don't get famous as a foreigner writing books in Japan, unless you're like maybe Carlos Ghosn, he has a, a ton of books. <laughs> um, <laughs> aside from the scandal. but. Um, but you know, like the people they love to invite to Japan are experts mm -hmm. from abroad, That's people right. who become yeah. famous abroad. And they will, they will make sure translators are in place. They will prepare everything for this world famous expert, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they're world famous experts. They're not Japan experts, you know? Mm -hmm. So my, my approach has always been to be like good at my craft, not mm -hmm. to try to get people to think I'm more Japanese than the Japanese, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, th I think when you try to go into those waters, I mean, clearly, I mean, I think probably you, you've seen a lot of people, you know, you do martial arts and you speak Japanese <laughs> to other foreigners. And, you know, <laughs> those kind of people are the Japanophiles and they're not here to like do actual work. They're here to become Japanese and they get no respect. Um, I mean, not to suggest that it's not hard work to do that, but you know, the, the real value that you can bring to Japan, I believe, is an expertise that's not prevalent here. Um, I think one thing that you do really great is with the design thinking, and it's, it's super new to Japan. We use it quite a bit, Indeed, and um, other tech companies I worked at, we use it quite a, bit at uh, quite a bit as well to develop products and apps. 
but you know that's that's the real benefit that you can um, bring to to society here and so that's been kind of like my approach to it um the the, the whole no business card thing i think it's kind of um maybe inflammatory to some people probably as they listen to this but uh the the whole thing about it is <clears throat> um like i i said you'll never be japanese and not to suggest that you're insensitive to culture, but you know you should definitely understand what your strengths are. Um, I, I kind of have a story about that that I um, from my work experience at Groupon, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, you know back in the day when you couldn't just buy a bunch of ad inventory online through exchanges. This was before they launched here. You would basically negotiate ad prices face to face. Mm -hmm. And they would give you a packet of paper and there'd be prices for CPM, 1,000 impressions of, of an ad placement. And you'd basically do this negotiation in person. Um, and you'd always get it before email, so you had an idea of what to expect. And um, essentially, like, you'd, you'd walk in the meeting and you just negotiate, right? Like, like anything else. Well, um, one of my mentors at Groupon, uh, his name was Ronnie and he was the international CMO and he taught me that you know, <laughs> you know you don't he's like don't tell them that you speak Japanese don't act Japanese don't. come to this meeting okay. with me and we're, yeah <laughs> don't come to this meeting okay. with me and we're just gonna be two foreigners that want to buy a lot of ads for cheap prices <laughs> <laughs> hmm? And so we would go into these meetings and he was like the bad cop. He was the kind of angry German guy. And I was the nice guy, but I didn't speak Japanese. And we'd walk into the meeting without business cards and I would shake their hands and instead of bowing and stuff. <laughs> and we'd be kind of these negotiating. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just like it's imagining how awkward point. that is. Like when you put the hand out and people like go to buy, like people don't know how that how real that is. Like that moment is so real. Okay, so you're putting your hand it's, out there, like actually, bowing. They bow and shake. Yeah, it's actually not that awkward because I mean, if you think about it, um, in Japan, there's so much emphasis on like being global and and understanding the cultures abroad. Uh -huh people are really eager to speak English and shake hands and stuff. So it's actually like, it's not as awkward as it sounds. And it's, yeah, not, it's, as like, it's not as rude of a, like a Gaijin smash scene as you might be imagining. Um, people are actually like really happy about it. So you basically walk in and I'd speak, I understand Japanese, right? And I would sit there and we would talk about terms and whatnot. And we wouldn't bring a translator. They'd bring their translator and they would just be talking about stuff in front of us. And so we just like hear how low that they were willing to go and it's <laughs> with, with prices. And so like I would hear and then I would just kind of drive and steer the negotiation box uh -huh. in the direction towards the lowest price that we heard or, or any other information I, I picked up in the meeting. And it's not like we're lying about me not speaking Japanese. We were just being foreigners, right? And they were speaking mm -hmm. English and they had translators. And so that's, that's kind of like the origin of my approach, which is like, don't pass them, don't pass them issue. Um, um, just kind of be your own self that, that you are. I love that. So uh, the, a recent Meishi story that I had in this COVID times is that I connected with a, a, new, a new person online and they said, Meishi, do you Like, what shall we do with our business cards? And I'm like, well, we're already connected by email. That's how we were able to send this link. Maybe it's not necessary. They were like, ah, maybe, you know, so it's gonna like <laughs> so if we would you still yeah, do exactly. that? Yeah. Would you still do that? Would you still do the whole like no mission could cap bad cop negotiation, like with the information that you have now? Would you still do that? Or would you say that was kind of like more of a that for that particular moment in time moment? I mean, at that point, like I wasn't I didn't know as many people. And it was mm -hmm. funny because after this time, about two to three years later, I met some of these ad agency people oh at an event. Oh my gosh, no, and they were like, John, I, I, what happened? Well, they, I mean, you know, regardless of any like negotiating tactics, it's always mm -hmm. a win-win. Like they're not gonna sell at a loss or anything, right? So, um, but like I, I spoke to them in Japanese and they were like so surprised because they thought I didn't speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. And they're like, 
we thought you didn't speak Japanese. I was like, of course I did. You just never, you always brought a translator or you spoke in you English. You never asked. And it just, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> a good lens. Good. <laughs> and so they would just, it just kind of hit them at that point. Uh, probably like what had happened and just, it was, and it was why, kind, of, kind of funny. <laughs> and how you magically knew kind of what they're going, what their lowest price was and that you were able to align <laughs> quite quickly. I love that there's so many of these stories that I think that particularly, I'm going to say in quotes, kind of like our generation has, because we're not the bubble managers, you know, that flew over with a family and had their kids go to international schools or whatever. We, we were the ones who like went to study abroad and, you know, we had these, you know, horrific times, like you mentioned, that you were, you know, you were between Tokyo and Osaka, that you were living in internet cafe for a month and these crazy things that happened to kind of like happen to us, um, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, working and, um, you know, collaborating with clients. I remember one thing that, that stood out to me was, was kind of just, people have a very, you know, have an imagination that the Japanese are very polite and, you know, things like this, but actually that can often not be the case, particularly when you speak Japanese. So, you know, often there's like a high level of expectation. So I remember, you know, clients would say to me, okay, um, I, I would like to have a meeting, but I have to go to my uh, child's like sports day. So come with me at the sports day and we can talk there. You mentioned um, a story actually when you're working at, at, at UBS, when you're on the trading floor. Something about yeah, um, a rubbish. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, when I was first starting out at UBS, um, I, I basically had to run between different places in the office. And um, uh, essentially what happened is um, I, I kicked over one of the trader's rubbish bin and knocked everything like out. Like angry? Yeah, like like I, angry? Something happened, you kicked it? Oh, or just, accidentally? <laughs> no, <laughs> accidentally. I mean, it's so crazy during trading hours. and. You have to like run to a printer, get something out, and then yeah. fax it. And sure. especially as a junior person, you're basically doing all the work that no one wants to do. And then at the same time, you're calling up uh, banks and you're you're telling them orders or changes of orders, or you're writing emails and or you're getting uh, emails, email-based orders, and it's it's just insane. Um, and so I accidentally kicked it over, and uh, the way I apologize was like super casual. And my my senpai like um person that was managing me she she got like really upset at me because i was like i spoke so casually to this very senior trader and the, the trader he didn't really care he was just like whatever. he was like oh whatever it's fine <laughs> but um i i just got so used to just being speaking in a very kind of casual way um and and it really upset some people right or whatever <laughs> <laughs> if, if we think about the, the experiences that, that that you've had because you know you've been able to kind of break out of this english teacher recruiter cycle which is kind of what you usually see in japan that you've been able to build very unique positions within within companies whether they are a japanese company or they're a foreign company in japan what would you say um you know that for you that's the benefit of, of, of staying in Japan. How, of all the global cities in the world and of all the places that you could be, how did Tokyo win you? Um, you know, I mean, it was just, it's purely opportunistic. Um, like I said, the recession was happening and it just, it just seemed like the best opportunity to, to weather it. Um, mm -hmm. But also, you know, Tokyo is a great place. It's super safe and clean. And um, I, I, I shared this quite a bit, which is really sounds silly. But when I was a student, I was paying like the equivalent of like 10 US dollars a month for health insurance. But back home in the States, I was paying like $200 a month. And it's just like, it's a really great country in terms of scaling with your growth uh, for costs. It's fairly cheap to live much cheaper than living in a college town in, in the US. And then also, I mean, I think it's, it's also super cool from the perspective of um, the international community. Um, I never had Australian friends uh, in the US. <laughs> I didn't even know like the difference between an Australian accent and a, a British accent. And then I, I, I moved to, to Japan and I meet a lot of Australians. I, I meet a lot of <laughs> British people and I, uh, 
I, I can tell the difference between accents now, for example. <laughs> and so that's just like one example of like the whole international community of that is, is like also super cool in Tokyo. And I think, I mean, as like a foreigner, you, you kind of gravitate towards that. Um, it's, it's easier. And I think it's kind of a little bit more interesting given um, the very big difference from what you see in Japan and, and interactions you have here. Um, but yeah, that, that was, I think, another really cool aspect for me because uh, I was kind of used to Japanese culture that, that mm -hmm. point at that time. If we take that, and obviously, you know, I, I can very much, you know, concur to, to all those things because that, that's why, you know, I chose to talk about your come anyway. Um, but if we think about what are, what are the opportunities for Japan to kind of close the gap when it comes to you know, even just modern ways of working and things like that. You know, we know that um, Japan, as much as it's a great place to live and as much as it's a great place to work, there are many benefits. At the same time, there's many opportunities for Japan to learn from either the global community or for, from other companies. And you being kind of that bridge between, you know, the international head office in Tokyo, what are the, some of the things that, that you've seen over your career that you're, that you're looking and you're saying, guys, this is our global standard, but we're not doing it here locally. Um, you know, we're missing a big old, opportunity. What are some of those things that um, Japan would benefit from picking up from abroad? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's there's quite a bit. I probably, probably some of the, the, the two stark differences I've noticed working at like really big like Western tech companies like, like Indeed and Google and Groupon um, versus some of my experiences in some more uh, local um, companies like uh, I worked with Sanke doing some consulting for them. Um, <clears throat> Um, building some some software for their website and like the differences are quite stark but um, one thing is I think uh, like the group based consensus and decision making I think it really stalls things here um, it's it's in Japanese it's known as namawashi and I think it's it's a giant cancer for the progression in this country um, a little bit more uh, of a they need a better structure in companies that avoids that and um, I think the way they'll get that is the second problem I think which is specialization of roles at companies um, the whole lifetime employment thing is, is really having a big uh, a really negative impact on society here because um, people just float through the company through their years and they um, all move up together with their uh, cohort with their class that, that entered mm -hmm. yeah their cohort the, the doki um, and so I think I think those two things go hand in hand and like really slowing down progress here, um, and uh, and so th those are probably like the two biggest areas I think they can learn from from uh, uh, like global businesses. So if, we, if we take that and we kind of start pivoting to the other thing that I really wanted to talk to you about today, which is that that new way of thinking about building products. And, and, and services. So, you know, we had um, many conversations about, okay, um, what the kind of possibilities are. And, you know, again, Japan being, uh, the, the, the demographics of Japan changing so quickly, um, you know, that we're only really gonna be able to close those gaps with new products, new services, innovation, new ways of doing things. But at the same time, like you mentioned, with that kind of, that, that lack of speed because of things like Nimawashi and, you know, the, the group think um, that that kind of gets stalled. But, you know, we wanted to talk kind of about a new way of, of using, uh, of, about building products. So why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about the way that you build new products and services? Yeah, um, so uh, at Indeed, so I'm, I, I'm a product manager at Indeed and um, in my work, I work with designers and engineers to build apps. Um, one of the, the most instrumental steps of that process though um, is, is doing you know, design-based thinking um, in, in, a, in a framework known as the, the Sprint. Um, there's a book by uh, Jake Knapp called, I think, Sprint. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And it, it, it takes the principles from design thinking and kind of puts it in a, a software development um, framework and uh, we use that to to kind of understand the problem and you start with the problem and understand the whys of, of how things are and then you come out you, you come up with ways to 
um, to solve those problems that the users have. And you leverage a lot of experts, um, some domain expertise around the problem. And uh, then you go about quickly creating some solutions to those problems. And the goal is at the end of the week, you have something that you can ship, like push live in terms of like building the code or nearly ship uh, by testing a very rough prototype, even if it's not like actual code, it's just a series of, of, of images. And you test that with users and, and get their feedback. And then you iterate on that um, after that one week. And so we use that process to build ideas very quickly in the incubator, which I'm in. And, um, and that helped me create this resume app um, that I'm currently running. Well, what, why do you, I have two questions before we jump into the resume app. The, the first question is, this design sprint model is really, um, sounds like it, it kind of answers your, your questions or the, the challenges, right? Because in a design sprint, you have to move forward. That, you know, it's, it's Monday morning, we have certain things to decide. They're different to what we need to decide by Tuesday morning. We can't, you know, carry on what we need to decide for Monday for Tuesday because that's what, you know, they're building blocks really. It's like this modular approach to, to development. So this is kind of a way that you can move forward. And then also this, this focus on specialization, Japan being like the country of generalists, everyone can do everything, you know, and, but what we're saying is no, we want specialized people to come. How, the first question is, how is that kind of being received by, um, by, your, uh, by your company or by your, um, by your team? Um, and, and the second question is, is more along the lines of that, how, before you begin the sprint, how do you how do you gain that kind of like stakeholder buy-in? One thing that I've seen often is that you know sometimes Japanese clients or teams will come and say, okay, we have a budget of you know let's do let's do X, Y, and Z, or we have a budget of fifty thousand dollars, and you're like you know, but what's the problem? And despite Japan being this nazi 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 like the five Y country, sometimes they just begin with anything and just kind of see how it. How it goes? What's your experience been like? Yeah, um, well, I, I guess I'm lucky. I've always been able to work with some like really bright people that are, are very like at the front of of progress, and and indeed, like it, it the, the culture is essentially the same as like a Google or Facebook. Um, it's it's product and user first uh, culture. Um, you make the decisions based on data and all that. So. Um, definitely very, the, the culture existed before I even joined. But um, in terms of, I think, Japan and, and not going problem first, um, I, think, I think it's, it, it comes down to that lack of expertise internally that, that always has them going to, to shop it out to vendors. Mm -hmm. And everything's basically a, a third party here. Like no matter what it is, there's always like a vendor. And it's, you just have a lot of kind of vanilla project managers in the companies and they have a budget, like you said, and they, they, they internally do name washi before they probably even like talk to you, for example, and they kind of have an idea of what they want to accomplish before they even think about the problem <laughs> or they have, they've seen a competitor with like an app that does something. And internally they said, we want an app that does the same thing. Right. And uh, so, so then they go to a vendor they're like, we want to do a design sprint to do this. And you're yes. like, whoa, wait, we're coming up with a yeah. solution before we understand the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. and so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it just still comes down to that whole like ex the experts and not having them internally and also having this, this very stagnant company culture in terms of employees that don't move between companies such a great point because so because people have this kind of i guess people abroad have this um image of, of japan being you know hard workers and you know being you know it kind of that you know intelligent and this is this is all true what we're saying here is is that they're not encouraged to specialize in a particular topic and this is this is a real challenge you know especially to in terms of product development things like that so why don't you then go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about this about this resume app because you know if, if for anyone that hasn't been to japan that japan has a very also unique um sometimes bizarre odd inefficient <laughs> hiring process as well why don't you give a little bit of context as to kind of the the 
the setting or the feel that I had different Japan also hires, and then maybe how the, the resume up in some sort of problems. Yeah, um, so it's kind of hard to describe how this how this resume looks. So I don't know if you can put like a graphic here. Yes, yeah, so can. <laughs> yeah, for the podcast but, uh, listeners, go to the YouTube video. <laughs> Uh, it's called Videk Show in Japanese, and it's essentially just a historical log of, of what you've done. Um, certifications, work history, academic history, and also has, has a photo of you. Um, it has stuff like your ship preferences, the number of dependents you have. Um, it's kind of, it's a very unique format. And uh, that's the format for if you're doing part-time work that you need to bring in. Um, and then for full-time job seekers, um, you also have to bring in this kind of Western style CV, which is more, more focused on your achievements. And um, it's highlighting the, the work that's relevant to the job. But they ask you to take, to take both formats in. Um, and then if you're graduating uh, college, there's a, there's a third format called an entry sheet. And it's totally different from those two. <laughs> um, so, so the resumes in Japan are complicated. To, to say the least. Um, and so like uh, what I brought up before about, you know, kind of, you know, don't pass the mission. Um, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, clickbait um, in a sense, but, um, you know, ideally, you know, you bring expertise to the market and then you acquire enough um, first party experience like of yourself or collaborating with someone that has a lot of experience with the market and you, you merge those things together. And fortunately I had the experience of, you know, working part-time jobs in Japan where I had to write the stuff by hand by buying a, a template from the convenience store, then going to a photo booth, taking my picture, and then cutting out a photo, like a, a photo and pasting it to the resume. And that's just one job resume. And so it's a really terrible process. And I have a lot of empathy for the Japanese job seekers and under, understanding that problem firsthand, uh, plus um, being able to like build an app um, with design thinking um, I've merged those two experiences and of those and skill set rather uh, together to to create this resume app that makes it really easy to create a resume here. Right, which um, is so, it's terrible. It's really terrible. Yeah. yeah, and so you know, kind of understanding that problem and having empathy for for the users of your app or the customer if, if you're in B two B, I think that's that's a real key element to to doing really good work. Um, and it's certainly at the heart of design thinking. Right? It's interesting because I've heard people, and I love your, your insights on this, is that they say, well, Japanese are super polite, the customer is God, and these kinds of uh, pillars of Japanese society. Obviously, you know, Japan is a user-centric, you know, country. And then my, my view is, yeah, but do we often confuse politeness for user experience. So for example, yeah, you, know, I agree. you have like, and I'd love your, your view on this, that like you said, like you have someone, you know, profusely apologizing that you can't make an online transfer and how sorry they are and, you know, very high level Japanese cable. I value an online transfer over um, politeness every day of the week. How's your experience being with that kind of like politeness for, you know, confusing politeness for user experience? Yeah, I mean, actually I had the experience today, actually. <laughs> um, I, I you, you, you currently with, with the, the pandemic, you can't go to a bank without reserving ahead of time. And <sighs> I, I had called the wrong phone number, I had called the phone number for businesses, not consumer accounts. And, um, this lady, I was kind of like confused at how bad she was with like understanding how things worked. And finally, she gave me this phone number. She was like, okay, so this is what you need to bring. This is how you make the appointment and stuff. She's, and she said, um, but you should really call this phone number because it's, it's for uh, consumer accounts or it's for like personal individual accounts, not businesses. This is the business line. <laughs> she's like I don't actually know a lot so I've been asking someone else about how to like tell you what to do and so I don't know there's there's something really 
kind of endearing about the politeness to a degree because like I called the wrong number and she was still helping me out and I didn't find out about it until she had like like fixed my problem and this is like a major bank right like they could have hung up on me or like passed me on or like transferred me and so there's like a level of in, endearing uh to to that kind of politeness um but at the same time I kind of understand like, where you know, there, there's a lot of ritual to it instead of actually listening to the problem, um, kind of like the process with, let's say, potential clients that want to hire you, but they already know what they want to build. Right? They, they don't want to hear the problem. They just want to copy something. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a balance. But... <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I guess I would prefer the endearing, overly polite um, and kind of dedication to to, to the customer over not at all. I, I can kind of have some patience for the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is kind of what um, is is most interesting because you know you and I have kind of spoken about you know it's two two foreigners who have empathy for the Japanese culture and have a certain capacity for the Japanese language that you know we've spoken about how we kind of get around it like how, how to get around those, you, you know. And I've had people, because I'm very not Japanese looking, I've had people walk into our, our sprint room and walk out because they think, oh, this is the wrong room. Like, oh, you know, this is obviously not, you know, our, our, our product sprint for the day, you know, because they see me and they're like, obviously this is not the person. So, you know, and they turn around and they walk out. So, <laughs> we... <laughs> Well, you know, you know, you and I've had these kinds of experiences, um, but, and this is, or, and this is kind of one thing that I'd, I'd love your, your views on is that operating purely as a foreigner is, can get you so far in Japan, right? But if you really kind of want to cross the chasm, um, obviously we don't recommend walking in and kind of being that, you know, that personification of Japan that's a little too much, right? Like we call, like manga and thing and, you know, the anime, whatever, you know, um, but what's kind of been really quintessential has been that ability to know when to push uh, and to know, you know, when to use your foreign card, but then also if you can match that with a kind of, if you can layer that with a level of empathy for the Japanese culture, that's kind of really where you, you can take your career to another level. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about how, you know, that, that balance between that foreignness versus, um, you know, adding that empathy for for the Japanese culture, which is again um, a reason how you've been able to not only build your career but also your resume. Yeah, um, I think yeah. Earlier you talked about how I think a lot of foreigners end up in English teaching or recruiting roles, right? Um, actually, look, when I was doing my internship. Um, you know, I a lot of my friends that were going to college. They they're working at English schools and um, and some of the franchises, and they were making a lot more money than I was uh, as an intern. So I'm and uh, <laughs> right, but like I was, I, I wanted to be very deliberate about the skills I acquired because I knew that would define me um, for the next step. And so I think uh, I, on one one part of it is in terms of the, the expertise that you can develop and and really contribute value to society beyond being a tape recorder or, or just a phone salesman um, is is to be very deliberate about the skills that you're working on and what you want to bring um, to Japan. Um, but then the second aspect of like, you know, layering that with Japanese culture, it really just comes down to empathy, I think. Um, like with the design sprint is you, you just want to like, like really focus on the problem, understand the problem, understand the user, know your user, know, know their age range, know the, the job that they do. And so, um, I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, I, I think in terms of balancing your, um, how much of your, your foreign ability to bypass roles uh, versus using Japanese is, you know, so long as you kind of have uh, the right understanding of the problem in, in business, you, you can kind of appropriately decide that. Um, certainly like I, I personally have like overstepped it and gone too much on the, the Western kind of very cold manager style and, or like numbers only kind of approach without any sense of feeling for someone's emotions, right? And people have cried and, and stuff and you kind of learn from that. And, but I, I think that is also 
in general, not just Japan, right? Um, so it's, it's certainly not something easy to, to do, but um, I think so long as you, you do focus on understanding the problem first, you can kind of gauge how much you can push. And I, I was exactly in the same role as you working as an intern and I had friends that were, you know, doing uh, other jobs where they didn't need Japanese and they were earning, you know, 50 times more than I was as an intern. And you kind of think, ah, I don't know, maybe, but, you know, resisting that short term, that short term gain for that long, for that long term gain is really, um, so has been transformational um, for me as well. What would you recommend for some people that are kind of beginning in Japan that um, would like, or maybe they're in a, they're in one industry and they'd like you know experience in another industry? What are some things that they could do to kind of get in there without kind of making yeah? What are some things that they could do to to find a way into that industry? You know, I think you you actually said it really well um, when you talked about short term versus long term thinking. Um, for me, some of the stuff I wanted to do, I made more long-term decisions, knowing that in the short term, I wouldn't be able to get there. Um, I think two examples was when I was an intern, um, I actually, I didn't get one of my internships um, at this podcast and app company called Innovative Language Learning. Um, I, I didn't answer a call for an intern. It was something where um, I answered a call for a voice actor and I showed up for the voice acting and um, the founder, Peter, um, he asked for my resume. He was like, oh, you, you worked at a startup in high school? He's like, why are you voice acting? <laughs> He's like, I have worked for you. Do you want to do customer service? And I was like, but you just like praised me for startup work in high school and you want me to do customer service? But I was like, okay, whatever. And I, I did it. And uh, he was like, you know, don't come to me if it costs uh, less than $500, just like do your thing with customer service, do whatever you want. And then I would just kind of like keep my antenna up to like see other opportunities and I expanded to do social media. And then someone at the company didn't want to build these physical products. And so I volunteered to do it instead of them. And pretty soon, like I had carved out my experience I wanted to, uh, to develop. Um, based on my interest and in just trying to find opportunities, even though I started out just doing voice acting for this one company, right? And then um, in my shift from marketing to product management, um, I did a lot of side projects. Um, I built software in my free time and found clients to, to sell it to them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I paid for coaching and, and I understood that I wasn't going to go directly from marketing to product ma management, which is a extremely competitive role. It's basically like consulting, um, essentially. Uh, the interview process is really hard. And, um, and so what I did was I found kind of an intermediary role at a, at a FinTech startup. And I kind of pitched myself as a marketer slash product manager. And I'd focus on very specific things that kind of uh, straddled the line of the two roles, right? And I knew I wasn't gonna immediately jump into product management even though I wanted to do it long term. And so I, I would make that, I made that half step. And then I couldn't get a product management role with that. So I then jumped into product marketing, which is another kind of thing that borders and, and works closely with product managers. And from there, I, I developed some mentors and, and got a lot of buy-in for me switching to product management and then eventually switched and went through the interview process and all that. So I think, I think whatever you want to kind of do, um, whether you're, you're in Japan or another country, uh, it's important to think that um, it's not gonna be the very next step you make. Um, and I think one kind of cliche um, phrase is, it's like play chess, not checkers, right? It's not just mm -hmm. like the next jump. It's, yeah. it's a lot more complicated and, and uh, long-term than, than that. That's so true. And this is maybe, what, you know, coming back to that user empathy theme, this is maybe why it's really important as well. Because if you're going to a company and you're not doing kind of like that dream role, then, you know, the least that you can do is go in and build relationships and, you know, understand what can I take, you know, to my next company. And I think, you know, having that patience is also super important to say, okay, this is where I am. This is where I, this is where I want to be. But also being, being flexible, as you, as you mentioned, say, okay, maybe I, you know, I joined as this, but then, you know, I'll do something else. You know, I've also had some, some similar experiences. So I think that's, that's really um, an important takeaway, not only for Japan, but really, really everywhere. 
So if we talk, if we're thinking about, you know, being very deliberate in terms of your development, being very deliberate uh, in terms of the, the steps that you're taking, uh, and also, you know, balancing that with, within a certain element of, of patience, maybe you want to talk to us about what's next for you. Yeah, my spare time right now, I'm, I'm looking at sharing some of the, uh, the lessons I've learned in my career uh, from marketing and product management. Um, I, I, I have this uh, company called Growth Lesson, where I teach uh, marketing and product management together. Um, uh, my, my approach with that is kind of uh, combining the two learnings, which I think not a lot of people do. Um, and a lot of, I think, education and thought leaders out there, they tend to kind of focus in on like hacks and quick wins and stuff. And none of that stuff actually works. Like, um, like I've tried a bunch of it and it's all very short lived. Um, mm -hmm. But when you kind of take an approach, um, actually my approach is kind of design thinking in that um, start by understanding the problem that you're solving with your marketing um, and then kind of then go to the solution and then understand personas and uh, and how your product is different from competing products, what makes your product special. And from there, you develop uh, like a, a one pager uh, marketing strategy, including a, a USB, a unique sales proposition. And then that's like the first step. The next step is understanding um, using that marketing strategy, how to create really good marketing messaging that your target user um, will respond to because you understand their problems really well um, and you've developed your product accordingly. And then taking that messaging as well and then planning um, activities, which I call tactics accordingly. Um, it starts out by doing OKRs, which are objectives and key results. It's a, it's a goal planning process that's popular at Google uh, that I learned there uh, when I was working there. And it kind of basically brings it all together um, that, and, and helps you um, uh, basically start off marketing and, and launch a product from scratch. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing in my spare time right now. And so where can people find more information about that? Maybe you can uh, give us the information we can add it to the show notes. It's live. It's uh, growthlesson.com. Um, you can add your email address and you'll get a free guide on how to create the marketing strategy. Amazing. And if, if we think about, you know, kind of the, the future and we think about, you know, one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about is modernizing the dialogue around doing business in with Japan. If we were to go back to you at the beginning um, of, of your Japan career, so to say, what are some of those things that, that you've learned now that maybe you would have wished you would have known then? Yeah. Um, gosh. We didn't apart from the yeah, sorry. <laughs> apart, apart, apart from the fact that, you know, everything's going to be okay, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess, like, don't take yourself so seriously. Um, <laughs> I think that's probably, like, the most important lesson. Um, uh, yeah, I guess... In terms of career, I guess I would definitely still, I wouldn't do anything differently. Just always kind of be open to like what interests you at that time. And you can always switch roles later, kind of like I did. Uh, but in terms of Japan experience and things that like I wish I knew, um, I don't know, I probably, I guess I wish I had more empathy for um, the culture. Um, and uh, I think what that does is not to suggest that like you have to be on board with Neymawashi and, and do martial arts or anything like that. Um, become a Jap don't become a Japanophile, but um, understand that, you know, any resistance to you joining a company or, or people um, being accepting of your sales pitch or whatever, um, there's probably a lot more reasons other than just you being a foreigner. Um, likely it's because they have to do Neymawashi on their side. They have to write this, the, the Ringi show, the, the approvals for getting purchases mm. and they don't think they could get it done. Um, there's a lot of BS that Japanese people have to deal with their companies. Mm. And as much as they probably like what you're selling or what you're pitching, um, they, they just don't think it's possible, right? And, yeah. and they're probably more tired than uh, racist or anything like that, right? That is so real, actually. That's really real. You know, in terms of with the no, for me, the no is very often the no of 
I don't have internally the strength to suggest this. For me, that's the no, right? Whereas it's the no is not, it's, it's very, it's often not, it's expensive or whatever. It's just, I can't even begin to imagine the amount of effort this is going to take for me to implement this. Uh, so I, I'm just not going to. Have, have you had a similar, is, is, that what you, is that what you mean? Like along those lines? Yeah. Like to muster up the strength, I think, to get certain things done in a Japanese company, it's, it's almost like you have to be a superhero to do it. Um, like I think actually there's something really cool and I, I'm almost positive it was Adobe who did this here, but um, there's this uh, conference for Adobe that's held in Salt Lake and I, th I think it's Salt Lake and it's like a three or four day conference and you learn stuff about, I think, marketing. I think it's the Adobe marketing group, but um, what they had done for potential people who would, who would want to go to it. They actually prepared a Vingi show like template packet thing. And so they were, they understand how hard it is to get approved for like a, uh, an overseas trip and how you have to make a case for why you want to go and, and then what you'll get done. And they basically did that for you and they did a really good job of it. And they, they helped you get approved so you could go. And they did that for the Japanese market only of course, because it is so hard to get things approved. And, and doing things like going abroad for a conference. So how do you do that? Like as, as, a, as kind of a, a wrap up is how, how do you muster that superhero strength required to, to lead, to be at the forefront of, of change making? Cause that's really so much of, of what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard. I mean, I, I don't think there's an easy answer. No. Um, I, I don't think like anything's ab absolute or explicit in the world, right? And you know, it's everything's a, a number game. Like there, there will never be a hundred percent of time. And whether it's like also companies and whatnot that you join, not all are going to work out. And so you just have to. I think you have to just um, accept defeat sometimes and move on to the next place and then try it again. So um, I guess there's, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. No, there's not, and it's and it's this constant, and I guess it's going to be different for everyone. Like what, when, when you draw the line, when is when is enough? You know, what's defeat? You know, you're going to have to use, you know, getting back to that empathy. Get, you know, come back to not only the empathy for for the client and the or the organization that you're working in, and say, okay, is this really a no? Or are they saying no because it's a busy time? Or are they saying no because you know of another reason? Um, you know, but also reflect and understand your own no. When is no for you? When, are you, when, are you, when have you said, you know what, I've really done my best here and uh, I could do, you know, X, Y, and Z, but, it, you know, in terms of the, the output, in terms of the impact, it's just not worth it for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to call this one a day, so to say. Yeah. One example I have is uh, I was, I was doing some consulting for this newspaper company. I won't, I won't stay here, <laughs> but um, uh, essentially we were working on this big project and, and we had basically delivered some software for them in like a tenth the time that their internal team had spent prior to us coming on board. And you know they had paid us and everything, so it was fine. But um, we had discounted it um, and made it kind of like a joint venture thing. So uh, there would be some performance incentive for us continuing on. Um, well, it got suddenly scrapped, and then our oh. context completely changed. And we're like, what happened? And then the, the president of this certain big chunk of the company, I, I, I can't say too much, or there's a, it'll be very easy to, to know who it is, but the president of this big chunk of the organization who we had been introduced to with a third party, just like, side note, that's a really good way how to get deals is always bring a third party that knows someone uh, to the first meeting. But um, so this president was gone and then some new guy came in and then the, then the guy above him, he was gone. And some new guy came in place of him. And so like this giant political shift in like powers um, had basically meant that everything the previous person was doing would get scrapped. And it was no fault of our own. Like we did well, but everything just got shuffled and it was everyone that was loyal to them and all their vendor relationships got moved in and all that stuff. So um, I think knowing when to like accept defeat and 
that it's not you, it's just something that you can't control is, is super important. I think, yeah, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And if we were to say, and if we were to, you know, because I'm super appreciative of, of, of your time because you're a super busy guy. And if we were to kind of wrap this up and we were to say, okay, what are some, what's kind of the takeaway that you would leave with a company that's, you know, kind of thinking about, um, you know, changing the way they do things, maybe, you know, implementing more of a, you know, problem centric, uh, you know, approach, user centric approach. What's kind of like a, a good first step for them? I mean, I think design thinking is great. <laughs> it almost sounds set up, but like, um, if someone wants to build something, if someone wants to build something new, that's like a really good start. Like, I, I love the process personally, um, but, but you know, I, I think maybe to, to make it apply to multiple things is just be open to expertise outside and not let people internally design, decide the scope of the project before they bring on the experts. And then on that note, I'd like to thank you so much and uh, for joining us. And uh, we'd have, we most certainly would love to have you back in a year from now when uh, you've grown your, your consulting business and we can learn more about, uh, about your resume as well. So John, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>